friends, in this uh, talk, I would like to uh, extend an invitation. And it's an invitation to you to consider and to participate in a sacred mystery. It's a sacred mystery that lies at the heart of intimacy with God. It's a sacred mystery that lies at the heart of us becoming loving persons. It's a sacred mystery that lies at the heart of us becoming the unique people God wants us to become. And if I could put it very simply, the sacred mystery is this, that if we really, really want to enter into the life that God gives us, we need to learn how to die. Come with me quickly uh, to John chapter 12. There's a very intriguing incident. Uh, some Greeks uh, come to the disciples of Jesus and they say to the disciples, we want to see Jesus. Now, obviously, they've heard about him. But now they want to see him. They want to move from a second-hand knowledge to a first-hand knowledge. They want to interact with him for themselves. And when that request eventually reaches Jesus, intriguingly, he doesn't set up an appointment uh, to meet with them. He offers his disciples an image. And it's an image that lies at the heart of this sacred mystery. It's the image of a seed that falls into the ground and dies and yields a rich harvest. Just for a few moments, I want us to stay with that image. I want us to hold that image before our own hearts and minds. And I want us to allow God to speak to us through it. First of all, it's an image that applies uniquely to Jesus' death. When he gives this image, he himself is on the way to the cross. There he's going to choke to death in his own blood. There he's going to absorb into himself, into his very being, evil, sin, death. There he's going to be put to death by very, very good people. It's going to look like a total failure of the whole project. After all, who believes? Who believes in a dead Messiah? But like a seed that falls into the ground and dies and yields a rich harvest, that cross is going to become a place of real power. It's going to be the place where God's self-giving love is demonstrated like never before. It's going to become the place where, where God's self-giving love will overcome all the forces of evil, sin, and darkness. It's going to become the place where the door is swung wide open in the universe to anyone and to everyone who wants to enter into the life that God gives us. 
I think that's why the cross has such raw power. You don't have to understand everything about it before it just strikes you with power. I love the story which is told by a Catholic a bishop. And I don't know whether it's true or not, but he tells the story of three young boys who, who want to play a trick on the local priest. They go down to the local Catholic church and they make up bogus confessions. Uh, and so they go into the confessional, make the, their bogus confession, and they, the first one runs for it, the second one runs for it, but the third one is unable to get away. The priest stops him and says to him, I want you to do penance uh, for the sins that you've confessed. I want you to go to the front of the church. I want you to look at the crucifix, and I want you to say aloud, three times, all this you did for me, and I don't give a damn. And he went, the first time, all this you did for me, I don't give a damn, said it again, and just couldn't say it a third time. And somehow that's the, the power of the cross. It speaks to us. I never grew up in a Christian home. I had hardly any exposure to the Christian message and to the Christian church. When I was 16 years of age, someone told me the story of the cross. It changed everything. It ambushed my heart. I just remember walking down Havelock Street in my hometown, Port Elizabeth, and saying aloud, Christ, you gave your life for me, and I want to give my life to you. And that began the journey. The cross has a real, raw, robust power about it. You don't have to understand everything about it. Who does? It speaks to us like a seed that falls into the ground and dies. It bears a rich harvest. But it's an image that also applies to our lives. You read the New Testament uh, there are two crosses in the New Testament. Have you noticed that? There's the cross that Jesus dies on, but there's also our cross. There's also our cross. Ignatius has really helped me here. That when it comes to that time, to the passion in the exercises, and when we're invited to, to, to enter into the events surrounding the cross. He invites the person doing the exercises to ask for a certain grace. He invites us to ask God for the grace to enter into as deeply as we can the sorrow and the pain of Jesus. Just to be there. Just to be there. It's almost as if he's, he invites us to hear Jesus saying to us at the time of the cross, I just want you to stay here with me. Don't say too much. Don't say too much. Just stay with me. Watch what happens. Listen. Just be with me. Ignatius was convinced that real compassion gets born at the cross. That as we enter into the suffering of Christ, somehow we are released from self-interest into a deep other-centeredness. That somehow as we enter into the death of Christ on the cross, we are, we are liberated from a life that is curved in on itself and our life is opened up to others. That's a lifetime journey, a lifetime journey. This movement from self-interest to other-centeredness. A few uh, years ago, three to be exact, a dear friend and colleague of mine uh, was diagnosed with a Lou Gehrig's disease, um, ALS, that disease of the central nervous system that has a terminal diagnosis. And when I heard of the diagnosis, I made a commitment to my friend and to his wife 
that every Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock, I would go and be with him and sit with him from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And so I started to do that, and he deteriorated more and more and more. And I found it harder and harder and harder to just go and be there. He couldn't speak anymore. He just lay there. And one morning, I'll never forget it, I arrived at the gate. I just couldn't go in. And I text uh, Debbie and I told her, I just can't go in. I can't go in. And I will never forget her answer. She texted me back and she said, Trevor, you must go in. This is the most important work you are doing at the moment. It's a lifetime journey, this journey of entering into the sacred mystery, of learning to die to self-interest in order to be compassionately present to those that we spend our lives with. But there's one more thing I need to say. This image of a seed that falls into the ground and dies and bears a rich harvest. This image invites us to practice dying on a daily basis. Every day, every day gives us opportunities uh, to die just a little bit, just a little bit. Last year, uh, Debbie had a knee operation and the doctor came to see her in her hospital bed and said to her, you're going to have to hire uh, a nurse because you won't be able to move uh, for the next uh, two weeks and uh, you'll need a 24-hour nurse. And she said to the doctor, don't worry, I've got Trevor. And uh, so I had to cancel everything uh, for two weeks to be with Debbie uh, lying in bed. I remember that first day. Um, Trevor, could you give me some coffee? Uh, could you put a little bit more milk in? Could you just uh, turn up the fan a bit? It's a bit hot in here. Could you pick up the dog poo outside? Uh, do you mind? I, I could handle it for the first day. Uh, I think the second day I could feel irritation and, you know, frustration rising within me. Can't you see, Debbie, that I'm preparing a talk on compassionate presence? <laughs> <You know? laughs> the third day, I was calling the Trinity to come and help me. I needed help. I needed grace. I needed the angels. I needed everyone who could help me just to care for the person that I say I love. Every day. We are given little opportunities to practice dying. You go home and you're watching a, a football match on TV and you say to the person that you live with, why don't you have the remote? <laughs> a person wants to speak and I, put, I lay down my agenda in order just to listen to what this person has to say. That's a death. I'm working in the office and a colleague comes and interrupts me and needs my help and I say, I'll help you. That's a bit of a death. These are little deaths. And we're learning how to die so that we can enter into the life that God wants to give us. That's the sacred mystery. Stanley Jones, great Methodist missionary to India. Stanley Jones once wrote these words. He said, in this world, there are two groups of people. There is a very large group of people who live only for themselves. They are the most miserable bunch you will ever find. And then he said, there's another very small group of folk who have learnt how to die and who have abandoned their lives to God and to others. And then he has this closing sentence. 
their lives are filled with a wild, wild joy. A wild, wild joy. Let's be quiet for a few moments. And as we enter into the quiet, I wonder how this sacred mystery, the seed falling into the ground and dying and bearing a rich harvest, I wonder how this image speaks to you and to your relationships and your work and your vocation today. My response to the sacred mystery of dying to live more fully is uh, <laughs> multifaceted. Uh, even though intellectually I recognize it to be true, it doesn't sound like fun. I am in the middle of an experience. Uh, I learned very unexpectedly that uh, I have an aneurysm in my aorta at the heart. And so next Tuesday I'm going in for open heart surgery in which uh, I'm going to be giving up a little bit more than I planned on. At the beginning, when the diagnosis first came in, it was really hard. And I was uh, very stressed. And I, you know, I was just holding on for dear life almost by one of Trevor's phrases that, that, that was of great help to me was, God made you, God loves you, God keeps you. And I just, in the worst moments of fear, I would just repeat that over and over again. And I did find that God would grant me peace. That having been said, though, it has become absolutely clear to me that this experience is one in which I will become a better person. I've already you know, learned so much about de dealing with fear and anxiety. And trust me, I'd do anything to have a different path here. But I also am learning that in this way, I think I'm going to be more like Christ and draw closer to God. And I'm hopeful that in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years or whatever I have left when I come out of this, that I will be able to serve him better and, and, and be of more use. It's taught me um, that there is a great need for trust, uh, but it's also taught me more that God is trustworthy. It's not something that you learn and then, you know, you've learned it and it's done. It's uh, a, a process and something that, you know, I have to hold on every minute. As I say, fear and anxiety are lurking uh, very close. But I, I have learned that there is another way of living, as maybe Trevor would say. And honestly, if I didn't have God, I don't know how I, how I could even begin to handle this. So uh, I just feel very fortunate. When Trevor talked about that idea of um, companioning Jesus in his suffering and how that opens us to compassion, it reminded me of my own journey with my mom. My mom had Alzheimer's for the last 15 years of her life. And it was during that experience of companioning her through those years of suffering that I learned what Trevor was talking about. Um, I'm a fixer. Everything in me, when I would go to visit my mom, would want to make things better, go fix her dinner or do her laundry or clean the kitchen or something to alleviate her suffering in some way. But what I realized over the years of visiting her was that the only way she even knew I was there was if I was present to her, if I was sitting across from her and looking in her eyes, or if I was sitting right next to her and holding her hand. But I figured out that I could look in her eyes and I could express love to her in a way that she could receive it and she could express love back to me in a way that I could receive it. And so it helped me learn how to, um, to not try to move in and, and fix and change for people as readily. That seems to be sort of the, 
the easy inclination, but so often there's really nothing we can do. And offering a string of suggestions to somebody is not usually all that helpful, but instead being willing to sit and listen and hear and, and recognizing that the, the gift of accompanying someone is the greater gift the staying with them and honoring their story and their reality and naming and acknowledging it as sacred. When I couldn't generate results by doing, what popped up in its place was an expanded capacity to notice and to identify with, to care for another and and to genuinely experience compassion. Um, and a sense that that was enough, that caring for and being with someone so they didn't have to be alone in their suffering was indeed enough.